Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 102 in our uh, four-year-plus long-running series. Uh, uh, we are on the road. We're out of town. Uh, we came to you from Brussels a couple, several weeks, three, four weeks ago, and a couple of weeks ago we were in Paris, and now we're in uh, southwest France, hole up in uh, our uh, kind of summer haunt here in the farm country uh, near the Spanish border on the Atlantic. So it's rough duty, but, you know, we do it for the cause. But we're back with uh, a, a session on polycrisis. Polycrisis are us. And uh, this is our, our go-to image on this um, from uh, uh, Kevin Gallagher, this fantastic illustrator for The Economist and a number of others. Uh, there's his his link he's just a, he's a, a fantastic artist that captures so much and he has a lot to say about a whole range of things and this just captured our whole notion about polycrisis even before we knew the word polycrisis but that's what we're uh talking about today is we're going to learn about today we have michael and megan with us from the cascade institute they're going to take us through the formal development, learning, research of, of this term, what's behind it, and why it's relevant to us. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, and we're an uh, open consortium of libraries doing innovative, we think, uh, things with technology uh, anywhere. Our partner in the series is the International Federation of library associations and institutions based in The Hague. And uh, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA is somewhere helping us out on the uh, on the operation here. Uh, our sponsor, principal sponsor this year is the Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, the, uh, the federal uh, library agency for the US. We thank them so much. Uh, we have other sponsors, the Internet Society, uh, the State Libraries of Michigan and New Jersey and Texas, wonderful libraries and just so helpful to make this possible. Our media sponsors are the Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast, both very active, smart media people. Uh, libraries, this is a metaphor we've come up with uh, trying to, de to describe libraries as a Swiss army knife of public institutions. I mean, they just do more things for more people than any other institution, just by a lot. Half of half the U.S. population, maybe it's down a little bit, I'm not sure, roughly half the U.S. population are active library users. I, you could have you could have pushed me over with a feather when you told me that. I would have I would have bought into 15, 20 percent. But, you know, I was just naive. Uh, so there it, it's just established that they are, in fact, uh, essential institutions. They're community institutions that are primarily locally funded, uh, which is good and bad. Mostly it's good because it's good that that allows libraries, unlike other institutions, which have very specific charters about what they can do, what they can't do, but libraries can do anything their communities want them to do. They're paying the bill. And so whatever their communities want, the libraries can do if they can do it. And they'll try to do almost anything. And one of the things they do is act as a, a, a responder in times of crisis, a so-called second responder. They're not, they're not police, fire, or ambulance, but right behind that, they respond. If there's, if there's any kind of major disaster, people will go to a library. I mean, the lights are out, your phone stops working after a while, you figure out how you're going who you're going to invite over to eat everything out of the freezer, but then you have to go and find out what's going on, because I mean, unless you still have a radio, uh, your internet router is not working, phone is dead, and you're you know you're stuck. So people go to libraries for information, communication, and electricity. It's it's increasing. So this term second responder is uh, it fits libraries and it's. It's increasingly more valuable. 
not every day, but when it when the proverbial hits the fan, that's when it is. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we respond we initiated these as a response to the COVID crisis in March of 2020, and then they just kept coming. I mean, the the Floyd murder. Uh, was like two months later, and then we had a social crisis, and then there was the economic crisis, and then there was the uh, political crisis, and then the pervasive climate crisis, and now we've got AI, a new a new type of a crisis, but nevertheless one that, that fits the category, at least in our our book, and then in war, I mean, we weren't expecting war to be a, a global crisis, but it is at the level that it's happening now. And all of this is a challenge and a challenge of understanding, much less what to do about it all. So there's more to come with COVID. Uh, you know, these changes are inevitable and irreversible. We're, we're in for it. Uh, you know, we never, we, we're not a source of, of happy news all the time. But the point is that, like it or not, you know, this is, this is what's happening. And we, we were doing a, a grant proposal a few years ago and, one of the uh, one of the reviewers or the or the institution asked us, "Well, libraries are already overloaded. Why should they why should they get involved in the, you know a backup communication system?" And and our response was, "Well, they may not want to, but like I said, people are just going to show up at the door. So like it or not, it's a good idea to be ready because it's going to happen. It is happening everywhere, and sooner or later, it will happen everywhere." Uh, this is our happy disaster collage. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the temperatures are just really off the charts. Actually, they have a chart, but it's just not a happy chart. Uh, this upper right panel was a, a storm, a, a derecho, I think is the name of the term. There's so many new weather terms I've never heard. Polar vortex, derecho. Derecho is a, is a wind, a tornado level you know, hurricane force wind that just blows across, you know, a, a region. And in one night, one went through Iowa and, and knocked over and destroyed not 40% of the, the corn crop of Iowa in one night, just like that. And then these, uh, this is a, in the middle, it's a reservoir in California, which is now full, but, you know, it doesn't have to be full. And uh, we're just in these cycles or floods and Houston, the, the hurricane in Houston, it just sat there for hours and hours and poured four feet of water out of the sky on this massive city. It's phenomenal. Now, AI, you know, is this the end of humanity? We don't know. Is it a boon? Maybe. Uh, there's, there's a lot of debate. And as, as many of you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about this particular disaster or challenge, trying to uncover what it is, what to do about it. Now, war. We have war here. So, uh, how do libraries deal with all this, this so-called poly crisis? Imagine that, that there's a, a network of of libraries kind of wrapped around the world. You know, the, the 400,000 something public libraries are all kind of knitted together trying to support this poor world who's longing for the good old days of merely fretting over the possibility of nuclear annihilation. Well, that's, I was there, you know, when that's all we really had to worry about. And it's so strange, but here we are, we're going to learn about this today. Uh, this is a definition of the Cascade Institute. Uh, occurs when crises in multiple global systems become causally entangled in ways that significantly degrade human prospects, I think is my so that's that's our starting point for today. Now, why is that um, something we want to know about? Well, that's a question we can have for our guests, Michael and Megan, who are with us today. We're so happy to have you. And we're very interested to learn why you come up with this word or where the word came from, why you've adopted it, why, why you think it's important, and why you think people should, should know about it, and what more to the point can people do about it? So welcome to you both. Uh, so Michael, I think you're going to lead us off. Mm -hmm. And so take it away. Great. Hopefully you can see my, my screen there. Yeah, great. Excellent. 
All right. Well, thank you. It's it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start just by saying a few words about the Cascade Institute, where Megan and I both work. It was founded in 2020 by Thomas Homer Dixon at Royal Roads University, which is in Victoria, British Columbia. Its basic mission is to anticipate future crises and identify what we call high beverage interventions that can help societies transition towards better futures. Um, so in, in addition to the, the Poly Crisis Project, the Institute works on the energy transition, which includes work on a, a major project on ultra deep geothermal power. And we have a program on overcoming political polarization. That is a program on ideological conflict. My own background is largely in international relations and global governance, security and peace and conflict studies, but I've always been really inclined towards systems perspectives. And that's quite naturally led me to my present position as a polycrisis research fellow. I'm going to let my colleague Megan introduce herself a little later when I turn the presentation over to her. So as you might have noticed, the concept of polycrisis has become increasingly popular, but it's used in a variety of different ways. As a field of research, it's still very much in its infancy. And so I want to explore the origins and the development of the term, and I'm going to try and explain why I think it's become so popular at this particular juncture in history. And then Megan is going to explain uh, our stress trigger crisis model and explore the causal timeline and key feedbacks that make up the present global polycrisis. So in essence, the concept of polycrisis proposes that what may appear to be separate crises in the world, in fact, interact and influence one another in ways that amplify their harms and makes them much harder to address. Mm -hmm. But people have defined the term in different ways and emphasize different features of the concept. So the complexity thinkers, Edgar Morin and Anne Bridget Kern, first introduced the term polycrisis in their 1999 book, Homeland Earth, to argue that the world faces no single vital problem, but many vital problems. And it is this complex intersolidarity of problems, antagonisms, crises, uncontrolled processes, and the general crisis of the planet that constitutes the number one vital program, problem. And so it's fair to say that the, the term was pretty vague right from the start. But this formulation does capture the, the dense interconnections between global problems. Those problems interact to form a complex, inseparable whole that we call polycrisis. And from this beginning, the concept has been really embedded in complex systems thinking, which is to say that our, our global challenges are complex and systemic in nature. So they really require different forms of, of thinking and acting than we commonly employ. More recently, during the pandemic, the Columbia University economic historian and Financial Times columnist Adam Tooze popularized the term polycrisis by proposing that in the polycrisis, the shocks are disparate, but they interact so that the whole is even more overwhelming than the sum of the parts. And so he's emphasizing what we call emergent harms, where the harms produced by interacting crises are both greater and different than the sum of the harms those crises would produce if they occurred separately. And here, Tews continues to argue that what makes the crises of the past 15 years so disorienting is that it no longer seems plausible to point to a single cause and by implication, a single fix. So today's crises do not have simple or singular root causes. They involve a multitude of different causes. And that just means that, you know, simple fixes are not going to are not going to work anymore if they ever did. And around the same time as as twos began using the term, the Cascade Institute independently started using it as well. Our formulation, which uh, we just saw a second ago, is 
Uh, a global poly crisis occurs when crises in multiple global systems become causally entangled in ways that cause major human harm. And so we tend to emphasize the systems that are involved in poly crisis. For us, a poly crisis can occur at any scale that hosts interacting, interacting systems, whether that's local, national, or global. But we're specifically concerned about poly crisis at the global scale. And we've identified eight global systems that can get entangled in a poly crisis, shown there in the octagon diagram. And so like Adam Tews, we emphasize emergent harms, but we also emphasize that the harms of polycrisis are direct and immediate, and they're also long-term insofar as polycrisis restricts humanity's opportunities for the future. We like to say that polycrisis diminishes humanity's prospects. And so we've developed this particular definition into a theoretical framework that Megan is going to discuss momentarily. So at the Cascade Institute, we've been publishing papers and op-eds on polycrisis for years now, but the term really took off when it featured as the main buzzword at the 2023 Summit of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Now, that's a yearly gathering of, of leaders, economic policymakers, and corporate head honchos. So the World Economic Forum's 2023 Global Risks Report noted that concurrent shocks, deeply interconnected risks, and eroding resilience are giving rise to the risk of polycrises, where disparate crises interact such that the overall impact far exceeds the sum of each part. And there again, we see that emphasis on emergent harms of crisis interactions. But interestingly enough, this particular report sees polycrises as a future risk rather than a present reality. And it uses the term to refer specifically to potential shortages of natural resources, including food, water, metals, and minerals. So it had a very specific and distinctive way of, of using the term. So the 2023 World Economic Forum, it set off this explosion in the use of the term polycrisis alongside some wide ranging criticisms and reactions. So for example, the opinion columnist Andreas Kluth stated rather pithily in the Washington Post, my practical advice is to stop coining Greek neologisms like polycrisis and attack complexity with simple words. We have problems, emergencies, and catastrophes, but we also have solutions. I suggest that the Davos honchos boarding the return flights and the rest of us just pick whichever crisis they know something about and get back to work solving it. So that's basically to say, stop using fancy words and let's all get back to business as usual. But in business as usual, thinking and practice tend to specialize in a single sector or a single type of crisis. We have people thinking and working on climate change over here, maybe health over here, economy, security, so on and so forth. But contra people like Kluth, the poly crisis concept implies that this sort of siloed approach is no longer really viable. We have to understand the connections between many different systems and crises and address them more holistically. And that's what the polycrisis concept tries to do. And so from even this brief sampling, you can see that the term polycrisis has been used to mean different things and has even sparked some, some bickering. It's clearly captured something important for some people, but struck a nerve for others. And so it's important that we ask, what is actually going on here? Why has this term polycrisis become so popular yet contentious? And what's really at stake in this single word? And I think 
the popularity of the term polycrisis and other new terms like systemic risk or permacrisis or metacrisis, it indicates that we're struggling at a fundamental level to understand the mess we're all in. Old concepts are inadequate and people are looking for new ways to think about our problems. But at the same time, terms like these are used in such imprecise ways that it's not really clear what that new thinking might really look like. So it's safe to say that the, the term polycrisis reflects a condition of deep uncertainty about where we are and where we're going. And that condition raises a few profound and consequential issues that lead people to either endorse or reject this concept. First, the term polycrisis really captures a widespread sense that everything is going wrong at the same time. Many people talk about a perfect storm of contemporary problems, but that metaphor suggests that it's really just coincidence or just bad luck that we're facing so many problems today. If only our luck would change, then the storm would pass. Instead, many are using the term polycrisis to capture their intuition that our problems are densely interconnected, not just, in, in, not just coincidental, even if we don't really know exactly how they are so interconnected. That's just to say that crises are not just simultaneous, they interact and amplify one another. And second, the term polycrisis to many people implies that humanity is in a truly unpre unprecedented predicament. For some, like the historian Neil Ferguson, uh, humanity has always faced multiple intersecting problems, so what we're seeing today is just history happening. For these people, nothing fundamental has changed, so we don't really need fancy new words. And it's true that humanity has faced polycrises in the past, uh, such as World War II or the OPEC oil crisis of the 1970s, but the present global polycrisis has several features that are truly unprecedented and are especially perilous. That is the extent to which human activities are forcing the climate and our ecosystems beyond safe boundaries. It includes the density and rapidity of global interconnection among a human population at its highest numbers ever and the unprecedented extent of our technological capabilities, including the many ways we have to destroy ourselves. And so these conditions make the present moment truly unique and especially worrisome, even if we can look to and study polycrises in the past. And it's worth emphasizing at this point that, as, as Don hinted, Interconnections between humans, between humans and ecosystems, and between technologies, well, they often bring us significant benefits. But once those interconnections exceed a certain density, they start creating the potential for cascading failures and for polycrisis. And so global connectivity is a key part of this polycrisis picture. And finally, as, as I mentioned before, many use the term polycrisis to highlight the lack of a single root cause of our problems. So some people, or critics in particular, dismiss the term polycrisis as a feint intended to distract us from the fact that capitalism is at the roots of all the world's ills and evils. Some are really looking for supervillains to blame but while capitalism and nefarious individuals certainly play a role in the polycrisis, it's a bit simplistic and reductive to posit these sorts of singular causes. Many of our problems arise in complex global systems that really take on a life of their own. And even more scary than the idea of a supervillain is the possibility that nobody is really in control. And again, if our if our problems are truly complex and systemic in nature, then simplistic solutions aimed at single causes are just not going to work. 
So with that overview, with the uh, the history and different facets of the term polycrisis, I'm going to pass mm -hmm. the presentation over to Megan to discuss our stress trigger crisis model and present a more concrete overview of what we actually mean when we're talking about the global polycrisis today. Over to you, Megan. All right, thanks so much, Mike. So just a quick bit about my background. Um, I started out in neuroscience actually, and like everyone else kind of saw what was going on in the world and wanted to be able to do something instead of working in my small silo. Um, just the way that we think about the brain, I think is really relevant to the ways that we've been mapping out the global crises within polycrisis. So it's pretty relevant um, and as as well as I've become kind of the global health expert within the Cascade Institute. Um, and polycrisis is a really new field, so working on bringing more empirical and quantitative methods here. Um, but yeah, so to get more into what we're doing right now, um, Mike's just given this really great background about polycrisis, but we've got to kind of break it down even further into what goes into the making of a crisis and how do we break that into smaller parts? So I'm gonna walk you through the model that we've developed. We call it the stress trigger crisis model. So here you can see the makings of a crisis, which we consider a stress um, interacting with a trigger event ultimately combines to create a system in disequilibrium, which is a crisis. Um, so a stress, is generally what we think about as this slow moving process. So it's the processes that are gradually eroding the resilience of systems that we know. Um, they occur over the time span of years or decades. And there are these pressures or vulnerabilities within systems uh, that make them struggle to recover from any sort of disturbance. So there's plenty of ongoing stresses right now globally. One we can think about is the very large and growing global population that we have is a continuous stress on the global food system. We need to be able to feed all of those people. And obviously we are over relying on oil, which is putting a lot of pressure on uh, the environmental system. Uh, so those are stresses, but to make a crisis, we have to have those interact with a trigger event. So trigger events are more of these fast moving events. So they occur in the scope of seconds or days or maybe even weeks and interact with these stresses to push systems into crises. These can be more unpredictable than stresses. Stresses we generally think about as something we can model and forecast. I just talked about population numbers. We can model how many people uh, the world is growing and how much food we need to feed those people. But it's a lot harder to predict a trigger event, which is more like um, it can be a natural disaster that leads to a bigger crisis. So something like a flood, um, it can be more political, like an assassination. Um, I think a really good example would be a lightning strike. So if lightning strikes an area that has a lot of dry brush, um, the dry brush would be more of a, a stress and the trigger event would be the lightning strike. And that can lead to a wildfire. So the lightning strike itself exacerbates the conditions that are ongoing, that ongoing stress of the dry conditions to have this kind of outsized effect of creating a wildfire when the lightning strike on its own wouldn't have that effect without the underlying stresses. Um, and so one thing we've noticed is that the trigger events are more flashy. Um, people tend to think about them as the most important event, but really the stresses are really what people don't address. So we call this trigger fixation, where people think about the lightning more than they think about the conditions that led to the effect that the lightning had to result in the wildfires. Next, okay, yeah. So um, the crisis itself, we define as this harmful state of disequilibrium. This arises Again, when a stress, one or more of them interact with a trigger event, which happens quickly with the slow moving stresses and pushes this system out of its established equilibrium. 
Um, how do we know a system's out of equilibrium? It's when the usual rules don't apply. So pandemic is a perfect example of this. The system was in crisis. How do we know this? We stayed home. Um, hospitals were struggling to take people in and respond to the threats that were happening. And most importantly, many people suffered and died. This doesn't mean that you don't have suffering and dying when a system isn't in crisis, but the suffering and dying is more, it's greater and it's more unpredictable. And so to expand on this pandemic example, which it sounds like you've investigated thoroughly, um, let's talk first about what some of the stresses are within this global health system. So first, um, we have a, a greater range of animal-human contact. That's as we destroy ecosystems, we're seeing interactions between humans and animals that hasn't happened before. Um, we have wet markets, we have factory farming. All of these interactions make it increasingly likely that there could be zoonotic spillover. Uh, rapid global travel, you've mentioned this as well. Back in the times of the bubonic plague or Spanish influenza, there was, <laughs> we didn't have the sort of uh, way to travel across the world that we do now and bring the viruses that we have <laughs> uh, along with us. So this creates a much greater threat for pandemics and virus spread. And then finally, we do have this ongoing overstretched healthcare system issue. Um, it's been going on many places around the world for years. This means that we have reduced capacity for treating patients and responding to any sort of health threat. Uh, so in the case of COVID-19 pandemic, um, the trigger event itself was the direct transfer of SARS-CoV-2 virus to humans. Uh, so this interacted with all of these stresses to ultimately push the system out of equilibrium and cause the pandemic as we know it. And just one note too, we've seen more tr trigger fixation here as well. People have spent a lot of time debating over whether SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, transferred in a lab or in a wet market, but that doesn't really matter. We, haven't, we still haven't addressed a lot of these underlying stresses. Next. And so, <laughs> we've talked about this. Um, so this is just us really mapping this out um, in a different way. So we've talked about the pandemic. We've talked about these underlying stresses. Stresses you can see in this one um, in this one shape that we have, um, and we also have mapped out different systems with this sort of domino diagram. And what we use these for is to kind of map out how events unfold across time and how these different um, stresses, triggers, and crises interact across time. So we talked about one system here, really, um, how these zoonotic encounters interacted with this trigger event of the um, SARS-CoV-2 spillover into humans and how that interacts with other stresses like this global transportation flow to cause the crisis of the pandemic. But that's just one crisis and we're interested in poly crisis. So then we have to add in these other systems. And Don, you mentioned the economic system. So you've thought about this a little bit too already. What we can think about is how um, if we move forward in time, yeah, that there are then these interactions with other stresses in the economic system outside of the global health system in relation to the pandemic. So the pandemic exacerbated all sorts of stresses happening, such as labor shortages, loose credit, um, and these ultimately interacted with this trigger event of acute supply chain disruption, which produced this crisis of global inflation that we've seen may lead further to a global cost of living crisis. And then we can also add on these other knock-on effects um, climate change is an ongoing stress in the system that we're seeing, and that can interact in ways that potentially in the future may lead to conditions of famine or even violent conflict. 
And so that's one way that we map things out to try to get a sense of what's happened, where we're at, where it could go. But then another way that we do this is to look at what's happening right now within systems and see how they're feeding back upon one another to create potentially dangerous cascades. So we'll start with this scenario. Um, this is an intersystemic feedback diagram. And this allows us to look at um, also different timelines. So we can think of about the arrows as causing another thing that it leads to, but then the timeline can be a little bit more flexible or ongoing. So think about that as you go through. And again, just note, we've differentiated stresses, triggers, and crises by their shapes and different systems by their colors. So I'm gonna walk you through this one. Here is just a potentially dangerous uh, set of feedback that we're seeing currently forming in some systems today that could really spiral badly. Uh, so we'll walk you through, we'll keep building onto this diagram as we go. Um, but here we have, we'll start with economic turmoil. This creates opportunities generally, we know historically for populist authoritarian leaders to gain power. Uh, they do this by taking advantage of and stoking this nationalistic, chauvinistic, anti-globalization ideology. And this then worsens economic conditions which then results in more opportunities for these populist authoritarian leaders. From there, these authoritarian regimes tend to reduce their international cooperation. They focus more inward. Um, and then this can result in a reduction of the benefits of global trade and economic cooperation, which then causes economic turmoil which further entrenches them in authoritarian regimes, increases nationalistic sentiment, and so on. You can see how this continues to spiral. And it gets worse. Um, so in the years ahead, then it's a little bit of a time jump in here, but if you think about a decline of international cooperation, that then very critically reduces the amount of um, cooperation that we would have in increasing uh, climate regulations or helping to solve global climate change and working together on that, which would ultimately lead to worse global climate change and an increase in we would see in extreme weather events. Um, we know that these would drive a climate migration generally from countries being hit by those climate change catastrophes, moving more towards richer countries, which historically it deepens xenophobic ideologies in those receiving countries, then feeds back into that whole cycle. And then finally, we know that these xenophobic reactions can precipitate violence against migrants. Um, also extreme weather events can trigger these sorts of um, violent events, they can be civil war, state collapse, even potentially international war, and violent conflicts ultimately deepen this nationalism, generating new waves of refugees, it worsens economic turmoil, and we can see how the spiral can continue onward and so forth. But we've gotten through this whole scary scenario that we played out, and the whole point of this is not to scare people. It's really to just help us understand these intersystemic connections. Um, all of these are making up the polycrisis right now. And by pulling out these feedback loops, we're able to look at how these vicious cycles occur and can exacerbate one another across multiple global systems. Ultimately, we hope that this will allow us to prevent these sorts of things from occurring. Um, and as Mike mentioned earlier, one of our biggest goals is to try to identify these high leverage intervention points where we could make one small change in one of these systems and utilize the same feedbacks potentially to cascade positive change or something good that could prevent all of these things throughout the system. So that's, <laughs> this is what we sometimes feel like which uh, is chaotic, but I just want to point out that this is not this is not outrageous. <laughs> There's not everything connected. We're not saying it's impossible to disentangle this. There's important causal connections that we identify, and that's a part of our analysis so that we can 
hopefully trace these out in a logical way to understand the poly crisis as complicated as it is. And now for better news, I'm gonna turn you back to Mike who has some uh, hopeful messages about how you can hopefully enact positive change with this sort of thinking. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I'm just gonna conclude with a few thoughts on maybe what you and the audience as librarians and concerned individuals might actually do to help address the global poly crisis that Megan just set out. Um, I think it's important that in some ways, libraries are actually on the front lines of, of the global poly crisis in that they're increasingly used as warming or cooling stations and shelters during extreme weather, play a, a crucial role in countering misinformation and restoring trust in public institutions, including science, and they provide a forum in which citizens can actually discuss the sorts of features they seek and think about how to actually get there. So I think in this spirit, you can help people to, to better understand and engage with the world's poly crisis by going to the website polycrisis.org. It's a website we've created to help advance the emerging field of polycrisis analysis and build a community of concern around this topic. And so it includes what we call a learning journey that discusses the history, meaning, and application of the polycrisis concept. It includes a library of polycrisis related resources. We have a, a map of people and organizations who are involved in polycrisis research. You can see the network map there in the image. And we have an events page for related events. Second, I think you're, you're well placed to help promote complex systems thinking as an essential set of, of concepts and tools that help us to understand and address complex global problems especially by, by looking at those underlying feedbacks, those hidden stresses, the more structural roots of some of these problems uh, that Megan talked about that often get ignored when we get too fixated on the, the proximate trigger events. And so to promote systems thinking, the Cascade Institute website has a series of narrated slideshows on complexity themes. And one of our partner organizations, the Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation has a helpful complexity reading list. I'm going to send these resources along after this presentation, the, uh, the actual links. And so these resources cover topics like complex versus complicated systems, which have very different natures, very different implications for actions. They cover resilience thinking, things like critical transitions and nonlinear change, complex adaptive systems, and even some system mapping tools like the ones Megan presented. And finally, you might be in a good position to help people cope with the mental strain of living in a polycrisis era. We, we know that it takes a huge toll on people to wake up every morning to a world on fire. Some people just try and tune it out, others turn to conspiracy theories, but I think the majority of us just feel hopelessly overwhelmed much of the time. But we really do need people to be aware of the predicament we're in and to envision better possible futures and to actually take action to avoid catastrophe, like that catastrophic spiral that Megan just set out. And so, in this vein, our director, Thomas Homer Dixon's book, Commanding Hope, has some useful tools and ideas for, for nourishing hope while still facing up to the global poly crisis. But at the end of the day, Megan and I are, are very keen to hear your thoughts on how libraries and local communities might respond to the global poly crisis we've described here today. So thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to a few questions here. Thanks. Oh, Adon, you're muted. You have certainly laid out a challenging scenario, multiple scenarios, inter interconnected, causally linked, scenarios 
of crisis. Um, we, the, the thing that occurs to us uh, about crisis response is, um, especially from the climate standpoint, you know, so what, what mitigation can, can uh, the community do related to global climate? <clears throat> Excuse me. Not much. I mean, everybody has to do their part and it's all going to add up. Right, right, right. But it's going to take very, very large uh, policy decisions and enormous uh, vectors of capital and restructuring of, of large systems, mainly financial systems, to have an effect. I mean, a real effect that, to, to mitigate this. So we've looked more at the adaptation side. You know, it's coming. It's here. Be aware of that, which you've helped. Thank you very much for for making that point. And and that is where the individual can be effective. Uh, the individual community, the individual person, household adaptation strategies will will make a difference, or can make a difference. Uh, and so this is the way I'm taking your super challenge here. Because you you just basically take all take all the problems that we're you know we're aware of and you said well it's actually they all pile up and they're more than than they add up to be they're even more than they add up to be so this is daunting you you really need to have a message up front that will that will ameliorate the uh, the weight of that load because it, it is heavy and. Uh, it would be it'd be much simpler to you know hide our heads uh, in the sand, but uh, even the sand won't be enough uh, when this when this really hits. Um, the um, the supply chains I think is something most people kind of understand how uh, a chain of events or a single event a lot would impact an entire chain of because you know, they're built for that. Um, it would be great if you had an example of a uh, opposite effect, you know, a complex beneficial event that would take advantage of the same inter interlocking relationships, but that flowed through those to make a positive effect. I I'm sure there must be. Uh, and I, I really take your point about stresses. This is where, this is where policy can make a huge difference. You know, uh, the trigger events will just happen. I mean, that's the inevitability. But if 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 the grass is not dry, then the lightning strike won't really matter. It'll just, you know, you'd be unlucky if you're walking under with an umbrella. But other than that, it's not going to, you know, burn 100,000 acres and 100 people's lives and homes and so forth. So the, the stressors are places where policy can be effective in reducing or mitigating the impact of a trigger event. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just rambling a little bit here. You, you remind me of the, the Santa Fe Institute, which mm -hmm. focuses on complexity, uh, interdisciplinary complexity issues. And so I wondered if, if, the, if the Cascade Institute had any relationship to the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, there is there are some uh, affiliations there, sort of loose collaborations. Um, the Cascade Institute has been just founded on complexity thinking. We've all been been working on it for a long time, so are very well aware of the sort of complexity thinking that's that happens at the the Santa Fe Institute, which was founded, I think, in the the very early '90s as as the hub of thinking about complex issues, bringing together all sorts of different disciplines from economics to physics to uh, sociology to computer modeling and these these sorts of things. Um, so we are working with some members of the the Santa Fe Institute on on various different projects. Seems it would be helpful. I mean, you're you're right. They're 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 just you know multidisciplinary uh, and and not so focused on the the disaster impacts of of crises. Just you know how complex systems work but certainly apl applicable to, to the work you're doing, it seems like. Um, where, 
where are you finding uh, the the greatest reception to this discussion? This you know you're 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 trying to generate awareness, right? You're not calling for policy, or are you calling for policy uh, prescriptions? Is that part of the work of the institute? Yeah, that that certainly is part of the work. Um, first and foremost, the challenge is actually mapping the the network nature of of risks and crises, understanding these these causal feedback, so we know exactly where to to intervene. But uh, we are aiming to have more policy and oriented prescriptions. So, for example, I mentioned the ultra deep geothermal project. Big driver of a lot of our our problems is is fossil fuel dependence and we don't necessarily have the renewable or green alternatives that we we need at this point. So one possibility that the, the Cascade Institute is working on is this idea of geothermal power, but um, where conventional geothermal power might drill down, say, five kilometers into the ground, access very, very hot water and steam, use that to drive turbines, and in that way produce uh, uh, a reliable and continuous flow of electricity that's not subject to, you know, weather conditions, wind conditions. This project is looking at the possibility of drilling 10 to 12 kilometers underground, which means that you would be able to extend geothermal power to, um, you could do it almost almost anywhere. It's not just these sort of tectonic hotspots where it's feasible, it becomes feasible in a much wider range of, of areas. Um, another I guess key example of of what we would call a leverage point that that might not be obvious is actually pension funds. Um, pension funds just have a huge weight in investment decisions, uh, in finance and those dynamics. But at the same time, they do sometimes have a conscience as well, as well. and so they're in a position to actually direct and think about how their investments and the way they actually throw their financial weight around might actually shape steer systems, things like divesting from, from arms or from, from oil. Uh, these are kind of seemingly small actions that could have a, a very big impact. And so those are just a couple small examples of the sort of policy implications that we're pursuing. Well, not, those are not small, those are not small at all. But you remind me of um, uh, uh, scenario planning uh, mm -hmm. and the story from uh, around 1970 or the early 70s, before the oil shock. Uh, Shell oil was, I don't know, number eight in size uh, in the world. And uh, they had a, a planner that... Uh, ran various scenarios, and one of those was what would happen if oil, you know, goes to eighty dollars, something like that. And uh, they realized that it was unlikely, but if it did happen, they were completely misformed. They had they had way too much of their assets, and you know, in one area, and and not enough in shipping, or whatever they 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 ran that scenario, and it would be very small changes, actually to shift those assets around, it really wouldn't make, the, wouldn't change their business model much at all, unless that did happen. And if it did happen, which it did, they would suddenly do very well, which they did. They became, I don't know, number three or something from number eight, just because of that scenario-based thinking and planning. That, that uh, fellow is now the head of, I don't want to get it wrong, outreach strategic thinking for salesforce mm. uh but that's that's kind of what i'm getting is is the ability to well run those kinds of scenarios and if you've mapped these kinds of linkages that could drop in and say well yeah this is a health and food and migration issues that will happen uh if temperatures don't relent in Central America for the next you know, two weeks, we're going to have this, this, and this. So it's really valuable work. It's just hard, hard work. And, and you should both be, and your whole institute should be complimented for taking this on because it must be a uh, psychological challenge to, to deal with uh, such dire circumstances all the time. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. I think everybody's kind of 
dumbstruck like I am. Uh, but uh, I think this is I think this is an excellent excellent session for everybody to just think more realistically about the world that we're in. And um, you know we've we've never come on as happy campers here. I mean, we are happy and we are camping, as a matter of fact, but it's not, we, you know, that's the daily life we all have to live in the context of this prospect and probability of uh, things getting more, uh, more difficult. And a second. Here. Oh, that's you, Michael. I thought that's a yeah. good question. Yeah. So I just put some, uh, <laughs> so, some of the resources I mentioned into yeah, that's right. if you want to proceed. Um, so we're we're up on the hour. It's gone really quickly, and uh, I want to thank you again. But do you have any kind of last words you'd like to leave us with, uh, Megan? You want anything you want to say about? Sure. I think yeah, this is a lot and it's heavy, but we're trying to be hopeful about it too, and we have to do this work in order to find anything hopeful. Um, and we hope to inspire different elements of things. We talked about those high leverage intervention points. We're looking for them and hopefully we'll find them, but also like policy about the lightning, like our policies tend to be more reactive to crises that happen instead of actually towards the stress. So hopefully we can reframe the way that people think about things and this complex systems thinking, and that ultimately that will make people more hopeful. Um, but Sorry to drop such heavy stuff on you. <laughs> no, no, that's that's good. Thank you. That's great, Michael. The last word. Um, well, there, as you mentioned, things like scenario planning and more concerned for for futures studies and and policy mechanisms like what we call adaptive management, where instead of a big upfront policy, you kind of learn on the fly and and renegotiate and rejig your your policy as you as you go. These are things we're starting to to actually get institutionalized in some governments and where there's room for policymaking to do a lot better in ways that respond to the multi-systemic and complex nature of poly crisis. So, you know, we're not inevitably doomed. This isn't a story of, of you know, our, our pending apocalypse, but it, it's it's a real challenge and it's going to it's going to be hard for a long time before it gets better. But it's it's not a hopeless situation. There you go. Not hopeless. I'm waiting for apocalypse to be become a verb, you know, uh, soon, I predict. Uh, I'm saying, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, this is great. I, really, it would be good to see one example of uh, intervention. I know they're out there, of course, where it had a cascading effect, a cascading positive effect to show it's the same mechanism just working for us rather than against us so mm -hmm. my uh my last comment on that but thanks again uh we'll be in touch maybe have you back when something shifts uh policy wise or i don't know but we look forward to it so Great. thank you and thank everybody the recording will be up hopefully tomorrow but we'll as soon as we can so Thanks for that, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so Thanks much for me. having us.